Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this next session of the ASA GA season opener. Uh, hopefully you've seen me before, but if not, my name's John Franklin, and I'm head of safety promotion here at EASA in Cologne in Germany. Uh, we've got a really interesting session for you tonight about international flying uh, with some great guests and a great host. Uh, I'm going to start just with a few logistics things. So if you go to the bottom right hand corner, uh, you should see uh, something called apps and then Slido. Uh, if you go into that, you should see the question and answers uh, or the Q&A that you can ask. Um, within that Q&A, you'll see not just questions you ask, but those from other people. So what I would suggest is think about upvoting other people's questions as well as answering or asking any of your own. Um, particularly if you see a similar question to one you have, maybe think about upvoting rather than uh, just asking any uh, another one on the same topic. Um, hopefully that works really, really well. If you have any technical problems, particularly if you have a problem with the sound, I would advise you if you're not already in a Chrome browser and you have a problem to go and try a Chrome browser first. But what you can do is if you go to the chat part of the system in the bottom right hand corner, uh, I'll be monitoring and I'll answer any technical questions that you might have uh, during the course of the evening. So that's all the logistics bit. I'll hand over now to Thomas Hutton from the Norwegian CA who's going to run through this session. Thomas, over to you. Thank you, John. And thank you for uh, the opportunity to be hosting this uh, session here. And uh, But first of all, I, I would like to introduce... Uh, our guests and uh, first that's uh, Fanny Pyre she's been uh, in aviation for more than 20 years and she's been flying everything from uh, airliners to training aircraft she uh, has been a um, ferry pilot for uh, diamond uh, aircraft uh, industries for four years I think uh, Fanny that's and uh, yeah and I am um, I know that you have been deliver delivering aircraft for um, the company to happy customers all over the world. So um, I'm really excited to have you here. And I know that you also now uh, is a captain on the PC-12 flying uh, around in Europe as well. Uh, and our next um, guest here, it's uh, Philip um, Hauser. And he's been advocating for general aviation in Europe for a long time as a CEO of um, AUPA Switzerland. I believe you began in 1996, uh, Philip. Correct, that's correct. Yeah, and I know that you also took the PPL in, uh, you got the PPL in 1986. And um, so, and you got almost all the letters that uh, is available for uh, a license uh, as well. Uh, and I really, I'm really happy to have you here because I also know that you um, arrange a lot of flyouts um, with AOPA from Switzerland, and you are going to tell us a lot of how that works and how to get in the air to do really good long trips and have really nice general aviation destination in Europe. So yeah, my name is Thomas. I work with the Norwegian Civil Aviation Authority, just as John said, and. Um, I think we just let's let's get just get, get started. The agenda for today, we are just going to talk a little bit. And if you have any input, you will, as John said, you will have a chat and we will also have uh, questions and answers and questions um, that we can uh, reply to during this session. And um, first of all, for the agenda, we want to um, talk a little bit about why should you go flying for a long distance? Why do you need to get out of the pattern? What, why do we need to go to, to see what kind of destinations uh, which is available? Uh, because we believe that is a really good way of using the aircraft for what is actually intended to do. And, we, uh, and I know I'm also a flight instructor as well. And I know that a lot of my, um, my fellow pilots, they um, just fly in the vicinity of the airport uh, in many um, cases and um, don't actually enjoy the, the what you can discover out there. So we are going to cover trip planning. We are going to um, talk about a little bit about threat and error management uh, for what kind of um, challenges that you can meet and what kind of um, solutions you can have available. 
and we will talk about uh, tips and tricks, what you can do to make it a, bit, a little bit easier. And uh, we are also going to have a quiz with prices. And John, he's, he's prepared a lot of good prices with uh, some um, um, uh, organizations that we uh, cooperate with. And I know that Philip and Fanny also has some good prices for you out there. Uh, so you need to follow uh, what we're talking about because the talk, the, the answers for the quiz you will find in our talk. So, um, yeah, uh, let's start with why. why. Why should we fly going on trips with light aircraft in Europe, uh, Fanny? What do you think? Well, number one reason probably is to keep you on your toes and keep you sharp as an aviator. Doing the same pattern and approaching the same runway over and over might keep your skills to a certain level, but I think if you want to take them to the next level, you'll go to airports you might never been to before. And I can tell only from my point of view, as someone who, um, for me, the biggest thrill up until today is still going to an airport I've never been to. It's like, uh, you know, another notch on my belt, uh, another another adventure. Um, and and yeah, what you just said at the beginning, the airplane airplanes were built to take you from A to B. It's only uh, the, in Europe that we tend to use it from A to A, which is not what is was made for. Um, so yeah, that's my take, Philip. Yeah, and you you had a really good point when we prepped for this this session. You said that it's so easy to fly in Europe. You said it, you oh. we we actually have you have been uh, all over the world trying to fly every. Uh, you've been flying everywhere in the world, like in Japan, South Africa, I know, and I know you've been there, but you said that it's quite easy to fly in, in Europe compared to other parts of the world. I, 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 I find, I find it easy, first of all, because there are planning tools that are, that are custom made for the European airspace. And some of these tools, um, like auto router, and I'm sure we're going to talk about these, uh, these different tools, they are custom made for European airspace and I would like to focus on on what the Euro, what EASA gives us instead of what what how it's different and every country has different uh, what we just read here in the questions already uh, the difficulties I think there's also a lot of positive things um, yes there's many different countries with different regulations but we all hold the same license just the fun part it's a bit like in the US that I can fly to Ireland straight from Austria of course stopping for refueling in between with my license, with my airplane, without any massive deviation. Will there be small deviations? Yeah, there will be national regulations I might have to consider, and there's lots of good uh, read for that, but I don't find it uh, extremely difficult. If I compare it to what's awaiting you in Africa or what might happen in Asia or in Pakistan or in Japan, Europe is a walk in the park. It's a piece <laughs> of cake. Uh, at least you can know everyone speaks uh, fairly good uh, English. Don't want to mean and name some countries where they don't, but that's <laughs> so I'm going to focus on, let's say that most European countries speak um, sufficient English for the aviation community to be able to communicate safely. We do have similar safety standards, which I cannot say the same for Africa, for example. So there's a lot of pros why, why flying in Europe is still, if you're trying to focus on the positive side, it's still very easy. Yeah, now I think it's a huge benefit to have the, the same regulations in many cases, just for like part ops, you have the same rules um, with all member states and you have also the uh, rules of the air, which uh, is SERA and, uh, and it, you, in most cases, it might be some deviations here and there, but in, in the big picture, it's much the same rules you have to comply with. Um, but you, Philip, you are you are having like flyouts. Can you tell uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what 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 is a flyout? Well, uh, a flyout is um, a bunch of people and bunch of aircraft flying somewhere to a destination, and uh, we do that every year uh, in August, and uh, it um, for one week actually. So we start at, uh, on Monday and we fly back home on uh, Saturday. And um, uh, we always choose a, a, a different country. Last year, for instance, we were in Italy. Well, it's so close to Switzerland, but who knows? 
our the neighbor state actually. And uh, there are so a lot of things to see. For instance, I can tell you, we were in Modena as our first uh, destination. We have always about three, four, or even five destinations we fly into. Uh, we were in Modena. Uh, what is Modena? Well, some of them, they know maybe the, 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 the vinegar for Modena, or they, they link Modena to Ferrari and uh, so on. And uh, I actually, I didn't know that, that Luciano Pavarotti came from Modena. So we had uh, three main topics. And when we were there, we went into all those stories and, and uh, to explore uh, what, 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 what Modena can offer. And you will be astonished. Other destinations have a, a, such a big variety of things to offer. You wouldn't believe it. So that's why we do not go to the capitals or to the big cities where airliners fly into. You can go there for a weekend and honestly it's much cheaper and everything's organized but the small aerodromes and we were in Italy on four aerodromes never not one of those aerodromes were controlled so they were all general aviation aerodromes and what we explored there uh, was fantastic and secondly and that is a good point and even uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, major point if you compare traveling by trains or by cars when you travel by uh, with aircraft you can make friends at those airports and uh, the local flying clubs they are more than welcome to help you and to organize you and to assist for your fly out and we make friends and next year they might come to Switzerland or somewhere else, you know, and that is that is something, uh, yeah. Only general aviation can offer such an opportunity, and that that's also a big part of the purpose of AUPA as well, um, as I understand it. Uh, like yeah, I, that, that is the one, that. and uh, uh, we we want to actually we want to have the, the pilots in the air. That's why they ha they did their license. But not only that, we want to show also those airfields around. Uh, what general aviation is all about. And then we can bring in business and we call the mayor on site and, and welcome him and he welcomes us. And then we, we can share uh, about problems and topics and maybe uh, if there are common uh, problems, we can find solutions. So we try also to help everybody uh, in, in, in its own way, uh, let's say for business or whatever, we try to assist and uh, help uh, people finding a uh, solutions if they have got a problem with aviation. Yeah. And, and of course, if you know the, the local pilots, you also have uh, local information, which might be really important to know about at those places, especially those small places. Definitely. But it's not always uh, that you find information available in the AIP or in the in official documents. No, no. You have to get in contact first with those local people. And uh, then uh, I never, ever had uh, somebody who said, well, uh, no, I'm not interested in to go somewhere else. Never, ever, you know. They are so helpful and to try to find uh, suitable hotels. I mean, if we do a fly out, we speak about 20 aircraft is about 50 persons. So it's uh, if, if we just for transportation, we need uh, one or maybe uh, two coaches uh, there. So it's it's quite a, a number of people, and they always help us. Um, and that that is really uh, outstanding. That's that's we, you only can experience that with general aviation. That's good, um, Fanny. If we go into the to the planning phase uh, today, almost uh, well, I cannot talk for every pilot, but a lot of pilots, they prefer to use um, tablets and navigation apps. What is your recommendation and what? how do you prepare for a VFR flight if you, you're going somewhere like for the for ferry flights that you have been doing? Yeah, that, and I just read that someone was already asking that from Hungary, which is funny because I'm also Hungarian, <laughs> so I, I get that. Um, first of all, because I've been working professionally in aviation, I do have access to to um, applications, but they're available to any pilot. And Philip uh, can uh, uh, confirm, and you as well, Thomas, that you heard of them, uh, like four flight Garmin pilot. Um, these are the the most common ones, and um, they they will assist you planning. But the most basic planning, what what I like to do is, 
Uh, there, there are a couple of sites and they're all for free. Um, one is, um, Sorry, I was hearing some uh, reflection or ricochet of my own voice. Um, one of that softwares is called Auto Router. It's like Auto Router, like Auto, like the car, or doing it by itself, and then Router dot Arrow. Um, that is a very helpful tool where you can enter your departure aerodrome, your destination aerodrome. Then you can hit the that you want to fly BFR or IFR or Zulu or Yankee flight plan, and then you can put in flyover waypoints or flyby airports or whatever. You can find out on what kind of approaches they have and so on, and we'll tell you how many nautical miles, and you can even use it to file a flight plan with that. Do you have the Autorouter web page up there so you can share it with us? Because I'm not used to, I'm not using that uh, in for my flights. But if uh, I, I can, I can. Well, while Philip is, um, while Philip's gonna give his bit, I'll I'll go online and then I'll share the share my screen. Um, so yeah. Autorouter is an excellent choice, and then there is one site uh, from the US which is also free, um, and it's called Flight. I will, I will, I will Google it and I will prepare it, and then I'll show you both of them, um, so you, so the audience can uh, can look into it. That one is basically just an aeronautical map, and that one is more for the raw planning. Like, uh, let's say you are planning. Um, I live in Austria, so I want to go to Valencia, to Spain. So it's quite a longer flight. So I'm going to look at the total distance first. Um, what is the range of my aircraft? And if I want to have coffee in Italy, because that's for me a key, a key uh, point. Uh, I like to have uh, the local cuisine in each country. So Italy for me is always good for refueling my coffee needs. So I'll look at the segments on what the, um, the endurance of my aircraft is and how much I want to fly. Sometimes the endurance is much better than my human endurance. Like my knees get old and my bladder gets full and you know about 45 of you start to age um faster than before no, no. you heard you sounded very old now so while while most of the aircraft that i fly they would have endurance for nine hours i clearly do not yeah. fly nine hours so i'll keep sure. it to four four and a half hours and that's probably probably good good time that's 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 the time frame i know i can take passengers kids um grown-ups men women likewise and i know that's the kind of length four hours what a human likes to fly without starting to feel squimish in a small aircraft so after i think that also depends a little bit where are you flying because if if i fly in like dense area with a lot of traffic i think shorter um is, is good if you have a bad weather as well using a lot of energy to analyze and to stay focused and everything so then a, a shorter flight is good for me and i think you can also discover small places to go to if you don't if you if you put in a, a landing um just maybe if, maximum two hours for for me i think that's good <laughs> let's see we're talking about even within general aviation we have different uh, sizes yeah you can go you can go like you as you say two hours two hours is too short for me <laughs> well it depends on what's the goal is the goal to get to valencia or is the goal to get to bari is the goal to get to mykonos or is the goal to to hit as many small aviation aerodromes on the road to practice your approaches to uh, practice your your radio communication it depends on what the goal is what well, yeah. because i professionally flew and not in my spare time, not with private airplanes like uh, Philip and, and EOPA members. For me, the goal was to get there. Obviously, while I get there, I like to go to airports I've never been to because it's boring to always go to the same airports. Yeah. Uh, it is comfortable because you know the runway, you know the, ma the main wind direction, you know the customs, you know where your GAC is, where the tower is. Or um, On the other hand, that, that gets lame. And we said at the beginning, why do we fly to keep our skills sharp? And, and yes, to get from A to B <laughs> instead of from A to A. Um, so yeah, planning the leg and doing the basic research first on how many nautical miles do you want to fly? And, and then, um, because I read some of the questions that people ask you, how do you even get started with an international flight? Definitely set your destination and set the intermittent destination, choose where you wanna go. And then you start doing research um, using tools which are different applications, which we're gonna gonna name throughout uh, this um, webinar, um, but also just plain phone. So I'm still I'm still a good old friend of communicating directly. 
So what I will do if I find an airport like Philip mentioned Modena, or um, the, the, could it be any airport in Austria, I still recommend the people just to call the tower um, and ask. You know, in in the AIP, each country has their online AIP. You can put in, I don't know, AIP Italy, AIP Spain, AIP France, AIP Sweden, whatever, or Suomi, and then you find some Finnish stuff that you can't read. You hit the English flag, and then you get to the English <laughs> bit. <laughs> I know, because I've just been to Finland today. So. Um, you, you read the AIP, and there's always a phone number. There's always the AFIS phone number, the tower phone number, the, the whatever you need. And the most direct and easy communication for me and I'm born 76, so I would say I hope I'm somewhere in the middle of the audience's age group. Um, phone calls are still the most straightforward and fastest way of finding out, is this a suitable airfield for me, yes or no? Yeah. And what I mean by suitable airfield, some airports uh, do ask you to pay 600 euros for a landing. That's not suitable, at least not for my budget. And I bet it's uh, you'd rather spend it on a nice uh, wine or uh, than on landing fees. So that might not be suitable for everyone. So there are airports that are for free. There are airports that are very pricey. Um, how long is the runway? What are, you know, whether is it an international arrival aerodrome if it's non Schengen? And now we get into the dark part of, <laughs> of coordinating and planning the flight, uh, looking into the legal bits. But initially, I would just call this airport and say, listen, I'm a small aircraft of this and that type with this many people coming from this and that country. Are you guys up for it? Uh, am, am I allowed to come? And then they will already give you good. They, they will ask, oh, what's your takeoff mass, your maximum takeoff mass? Uh, what's your wingspan? I mean, if you're small, they're not going to ask that. But these are optional questions. And then they're going to give you already an insight. Are you welcome there or mm, not so much? So if you're talking more general aviation size aircraft, uh, then uh, probably as Philip already mentioned, they're going to be very happy to help you. They're looking forward to host you because that's what they're there for, right? So um, a good tip, as this is a, one of my, my first tips, let's put it that way. Um, when you're planning a flight and you say, okay, I want to go to Milano because I always wanted to go to Milano, to Milan, yeah? There's a small little airport in the north part of Milan. You don't have to go to Malpensa or any of the big internationals because they're going to be complicated to taxi. They're going to be expensive to pay the landing fees. There's going to be mandatory handling. You don't want all that. They have a perfectly fine little Milanese uh, hobby aerodrome that belongs to the local flight club. It's beautiful. It's a, uh, I think, 1,000 meter runway. Um, and you do a little bit of uh, homework and you read up or you look at the charts, you do your homework. I, it's, it's not that hard to approach. So this is how I would go about starting flight planning. Look where you want to go, find the good airfields. And, and for that point, if you enter into Google, there's lots of um, uh, chat rooms or groups where fellow pilots, general uh, aviators uh, exchange information. But if you enter small airports Greece or um, general aviation airports Greece or um, uh, I don't know um, nicest airports in Italy for <laughs> aviation. Well, kind of like this you use some keywords and you start looking and you will soon find out what are the different options or who can you talk to there are a couple of I, I, I will open some pages now uh, the pages that I use to find out the basic info yeah and and like uh, you flip like aupa you have you do you have you call chapters or local what do you call it in each country are you affiliates, representing affiliates we call affiliates. them affiliates. yeah okay. we have some 25 26 affiliates something like that and um what well, is a website uh, where you can see all the contact information of all affiliates worldwide and there's about uh, uh, some 82 or 83, something like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, AOPA members, wherever they uh, are members, can contact them and ask for the for uh, some information. And yeah. um, uh, one information, and that is for me the most critical one, is where do you get the fuel? Can you mm. get the fuel? uh sometimes they don't have afgas and we ha still have some engines they need afgas uh, <laughs> sometimes they have mogas and uh, uh or sometimes they say okay we have got fuel but not over the weekend things like that or we have fuel but only for the local people and things like that uh fuel is the most critical point in the in the entire uh, organization and planning 
Yeah, um, that's the same as in Norway, because in the northern parts, it's very few airports which actually supply with 100 LL. So if you got the diesel engine, that's a, maybe an easier way to get fuel in, in, in this part of, the, of Europe, though. We were in Romania uh, once, uh, some 10 years ago. No, less. Anyway, and um, the, just a few days before we were there, uh, they announced that uh, there's no fuel available anymore. No. In the entire country. So, uh, what do you do then? You know, so we, we got actually a, a fuel truck uh, full of uh, F gas and he followed us on our path through the country so we could refuel. <laughs> but that is, of course, that is uh, um, uh, an exception. But then, uh, uh, addition to what you said, funny, um, it depends whether you organize a, a trip just for one plane or for several planes, whether you are a group and how big is the group and all that, you know, uh, that is, that is also a, a point you have to, to see first. And then, of course, what do you want? Uh, last time, um, in, when we were in the north in, in Denmark, in Denmark, actually, uh, we wanted to do an island hopping. So we just flew on all those islands. That was our theme. And you have to know first what you want to do. Very important. And uh, as you said, uh, don't fly into Milano, never, never. Actually, that airfield is called Bresso. Brescia, Brescia, yeah, or Bresso. 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 Yeah, Bresso. E -R -E -S -S Bresso, yeah. yeah. Very, very good. Um, uh, uh, one landing is, is below 10 euro. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's perfect. And you have uh, customs, you have everything there. Well, you only need customs That's if you fly from Switzerland. <laughs> but for the non, uh, man, uh, now the, 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 the Brits, they also have to do customs. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, that, that is, uh, those are the, the, the difficult, uh, the, the, the very important points uh, for, from my side. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'm, uh, uh, funny, she said that uh, it's what four flight was her cup of tea, but for me, I use like, I really like Sky Demon. Uh, and I think this is like just a personal preference. When you buy an app or you get started with an app, it's you, you stick to it because it costs money and you need a subscription to get the, the um, airspace up to date. But uh, I really like one feature in, in Skydemon and that's the pilot notes. Um, so you can share your thoughts about uh, airport or if you visit there and if you have some good experience or if you have some bad experience, you can give some feedback that other pilots can read. Um, I think that's only for like sky demons if you need to be a sky demon user. So we should have a system which actually talked with all the apps and so you could yeah. share your thoughts uh, across uh, any platform because that's flight safety, I think, in many cases as well. Uh, Fanny, you. Uh, I, I, so now I just quickly browse my brain on what are the applications that I've used in the past couple of years to plan flights over Europe. So Sky Demon, you mentioned for flight, Rocket Route, and Garmin Pilot. These are the most common ones in Europe. Um, yes, they all cost money, but I open now my screen and I put in um, the one I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to share my screen with you, if I may. Please do. Um, which I already once knew how to do. Share here. <laughs> open System Preferences. Yes. Okay. Um, Feel free to chit chat me while I do here the screen. But you're, you're a Mac user, aren't, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm at the privacy okay. and security settings, and I'm sure I'll figure it out in a couple seconds. Maybe Thomas, really... just to mention, uh, if, if people keep uh, an eye on the chat when you talk about things like the IOPA affiliates page and that Bresso airport, I just keep dropping links in the chat as you go. So um, Perfect. that Perfect. helps people as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, John. That's good. That's good. It's uh, getting a little bit more alive then. It's easier to find. And if people do have some kind of suggestions or cryptic uh, links they want to share, please just drop it in the in the chat as well. And, and actually, maybe now is a quite a quick moment to mention our General Aviation Europe Facebook page. If anybody hadn't found that, and also the ASA GA uh, community site, but particularly the Facebook page, I think is a great place to. You know, we see already a lot of people sharing trip reports and their own experiences going to different places. And yeah, it's just great to kind of have somewhere to share that kind of information. 
So the, the, the good news is that I know the two pages I want to share with you. The bad news is um, I would have to close my WebEx to um, authorize oh. because because we practiced before on the other other application. It wasn't WebEx or on the Microsoft. Uh, what was it called? Um, teams. The other chat. Yeah, we practiced on Teams. So I, I opened Teams to allow the, to share the contest. But uh, John, you're listening, right? So what if I just tell you the names of these pages and you look it up? One is Auto Router, it literally spelled just like auto, like the automobile a router, like, you know, finding a flight route and then dot arrow. If you could just um, put that in. And um, yep, I'm just sharing it now. Okay, perfect. And the other one I use uh, is called skyvector.com, just as you spell it, skyvectors.com. That's an FAA site. So that's the auto router. What I want to say about this, you want to sign up. It is not going to spam you. It's not going to send you anything. It's not going to ask of your data. You don't have to pay anything. It's, it's, it's a very um, easy to sign up once. And that is for free. It's a great flight planning tool. It, it's, and you can also file your flight plan and it will give you routes that are approved, uh, VFR, IFR, Zulu, a Yankee flight plan that are approved by Eurocontrol. And then you can use it to manually file it, or you can use it to whatever. This tool also has mass and balance and performance calculations. So if you punch in the data of your aircraft, like basic empty mass, you, the, the envelope parameters, um, performance data from your POH or AFM, then this tool will be able to, um, uh, you can save, you can save your aircraft's call sign and it's going to be there on your computer and your browser and you can use it over and over. So this is super handy. I love it. Um, the other one I want to share with you, the American site um, is uh, skyvector.com. Yes, so here is the same. Um, you once have to sign in, use your email and, and, you know, just sign in. And then you can change here at the right top. You see it says world high, world low, world VFR. You can change. Um, here you will get weather, active air spaces. And then if you hit um, here on this side, it says flight plan. Um, you can hit it and then you can put in your from to the ICAO codes. Um, you can put in your uh, your ground, your true airspeed, your altitude. And this one is more basic. This will not tell you how to fly or it does not tell you what Brussels is recommending you to fly. But it will show you the legs in nautical miles. It will give you generally an idea eastbound, westbound, semi-magnetic rules and so forth. It will show you runway information and it leads you to further pages. So if you click on one of these green dots, which is an airport, um, you will see more information about the airport runway length, runway um, frequencies, and then you can go into it and it will give you even more it's and bits. So this is also what I use for the basic stages, the first steps of planning across uh, across European or uh, a longer flight trip. These are just basic tools that I use. So I use a combination like windy for weather and so forth, because then of course, um, if you're doing flights for, for, for being efficient to get from A to B, like I do when it's a professional environment and you, you, you need to some, be some kind of economic and you want to, you know, be able to tell your ground speed, you use windies and then you can find out here on the right side, you can put in your altitude uh, that you're cruising at or what, what you like, like 12,000 feet where you don't need oxygen or just the limit where you might want to start using oxygen. And then you find out your basic wind direction. You have the possibility to look into the next couple of days if you want to plan ahead. So Windy is a fantastic tool. It's also for free. You can click on it. And also Windy will also give you um, METAR, TAF and NOTAMS, I believe, once you log in. So it has some aviation information as well. Windy, by the way, comes from uh, Czech Republic or Slovakia, some 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 aviators who who started working with this. Yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. It's it's oh, like it's, it's, it's like a site they they just get the data as I understand it. They don't yeah. provide it's not anything self, but they display it in a very nice uh, way. Wait. I think we will talk about the the weather apps and the weather yeah. services uh, um, um, yeah. shortly. But before we leave this about navigation, I think there's a couple of things, and that from the like from the regulation in part ops that you always need to have. Uh, charts which is up to date so and that's so easy with the with the electronic uh, charts because you can just press a button and everything updates like if you got all those old paper maps so 
paper charts, you need to actually keep them updated. It's a really big job, but I think that you can, of course, have a paper chart to as a backup if something goes wrong. For myself, I use like uh, um, um, iPad with uh, as, as I used for the navigation um, mini iPad, um, and I use I always store the the um, the planning in in the cloud in in a cloud. So if this fails, I can just go for my phone, and I can keep navigating on that that one as well. For this is for VFR uh, use uh, in the, in the, in my case though. And I, th I, I think that's quite nice. Uh, in lately, we had a lot of like GNS as like the GPS is signals is getting really bad in some parts of Norway for some reason. And you can read about that in, uh, in uh, SIBs from Elsa as well, because we have some parts in Europe that you, you cannot trust the GPS signal at um, every place. So, um, so that's a can be a, also a good tip that you also need some some backup uh, to to keep you covered. Uh, we just started to talk about the weather because everybody talks about the weather. It's hard to do something about it, but we got some really good apps there as well. As uh, Fanny said, uh, like uh, windy. And I also prepared um, Windy here because it's it's another function I really like in Windy. And if I can share my screen for a short while here, I would like to like share this one. Let's see. So if you can see my screen now. Um, a really good function in Windy is like uh, you can uh, see the webcams. And that uh, is a really good source to see the current weather. Uh, as uh, like me, I'm, I'm up here in Bode, and I also put on some uh, good um, animations of the weather here. But if you look closely, you have all these cameras, and I think these cameras, they are really nice. And you can even see uh, how old the, the picture is. And oh, beautiful look... spring weather, huh? Yeah, it's it's a little bit snow today. We have a lot of snow. <laughs> Jesus. Just, just find your skis. But we've got the sun now, so we are happy. It's like in Rovignami, where I just yeah. been. It's similar. So <laughs> if I want to go and see at your destination, I need to go down here, I guess. Tuskland, yeah, a bit more. Yep, Österrike, there we go, and there's Switzerland. I'm Swedish. Oh, yeah. it's dark there, yeah. Oh, already. But I can see the, like, the cloud ceiling here as well. I flew uh, from Norway down to Spain uh, for some years ago, and they had something, it's called uh, GA4, GA4. Is it? GAFOR, yeah. GAFOR, yeah. GAFOR, yeah. And I was quite impressed by that it was really good uh, for my opinion uh, is your are you thinking the same I, I think all the nations all the states have got a cover system i'm not too sure but i think most of them at least they have yeah well not norway <laughs> okay we, we don't have it uh, like like in germany because it, i think it also was in skydemon as well so i could see which part had uh, uh, VFR weather. I think that was quite good. So I, I already told you when we were chatting beforehand that I use something called Gramet uh, yeah. to remember. And that is just brilliant. But like with every weather forecast or with every weather, it's, it's, it, it can't be, it's for me, it's not my sole source for weather. So I usually take five, six different sources. But what's beautiful about Gromit is that it will give you a cross section of your flight path, your climb, your cruise, your descent. It will give you orographic features. It will give you daylight, night, night time. So it shows like half of, <gasps> half of it is dark. Sorry. Just a second, please. I've got to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I heard she talked about Gromit. Um, I tried to find it before this webinar, but I couldn't find it. So finally need to, to show us that. Um, when it comes like um, pages like uh, Windy, um, you can also um, choose what kind of uh, model 
you want to use because I know that SOMLs works really good in Norway, but SOMLs are not really that good. Uh, they they quite off the real weather. Um, and there is also a Norwegian uh, weather service called the IR, and that's uh, also include like um, local data as well, not just a, not a, like a prognosis model. I think that's good. Um, I'm back. <laughs> Back on the that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, Silent, like mama. <laughs> yeah, a little maverick just came in. Yeah. So I've just found the link for Gramit. I'm just posting it here now. It's part of Auto Router, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. You, you can access it through Auto Router, but there's other options as well. But the reason why I like Gramit is because Gramit is taking Germany's, Norway's, US, NOAA. Um, all the data from all international um, providers and it combines it and uh, it will give you information about cloud coverage turbulences precipitation um, icing thunder you name it everything that is actually uh, relevant for your flight you will get on a grammar but again it's a forecast so treat it as a forecast um, not, it's not set in stone. Whether for for me, what I learned throughout the many years that I've been doing global flying with small aircraft is that I always have to keep in mind, no matter how good the forecast is, it still just says stays a forecast. So weather can be totally different. <laughs> it's a good idea on what might come, but it's not set in stone. So just be cautious using any of it. So looking at the classic um, sick chart, winds aloft. The things that you learned in your PPL or that you in your ATPL or CPL, whatever you, your theory you learned in your country, um, I would use those still, like all the classic uh, weather prognostic charts. I'd still combine with modern technology like Windies and the, and Gramet. But for sure, the most key that I use is Gramet. For sure, that I can use all around the world. It will give me a good idea on what's to come. Mm -hmm. Combine with Windy, it you you'll have a you'll have a neat idea. And and that this is the big difference. But if you just fly in the vicinity of the of your of your airport, you more or less can look out the window and see. Okay, this is the weather. Uh, even though in the in the northern parts of Norway, the the weather changed really quick, though. Um, but I think even when you go on really long trips, you are not you don't know the 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 weather. You will find en route and local differences, which you really need to check before you go. <laughs> Because bad weather, that's a really bad situation uh, for flying VFR as well. Everybody knows that, which I've been flying for it. Especially you, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you. We, don't 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 go there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I we, 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 we all do mistakes, you know, Fanny. We all do mistakes. Um, yeah. No, but when I wanted to say, you, you're right. Um, weather can change quickly and... and uh, leaving your comfort zone, leaving your home aerodrome to go somewhere far away in Europe um, bears the risk of changing weather or, you know, going through weather systems. On the other hand, we're talking general aviation, so you're not commercially driven. You make that choice of taking that flight before the flight. And if the weather is not good, you say, OK, I'm not flying today. We're staying in lovely Modena or we're staying in lovely Milano. You know, one is forcing you. And I think uh, we can agree that the best the, the most important choice a pilot ever makes is do I go fly or not in this in this non-commercial world that we are now addressing like this is a general yeah, I, I, I think that's a really good point because um like you, for your trips uh Philip how much if you go how much do you time do you want to spend do you put in some spare days if you get bad weather because if you go like 20 aircraft together, you kind of get really stuck with a lot of people. Well, uh, so far I have organized uh, 26 flyouts and only one, and this was actually my very first one, um, I run into troubles. Otherwise, we always had good luck. We were in the third or fourth week of August, always good weather, and we never ever had real big troubles. Um, what, uh, but to come back on what you said, what I do is I always organize or I always keep one uh, day 
uh, non-flying day to allow people to really to rest or to to see what they want maybe they want to stay in bed the other one uh, want to to do some uh, wellness i don't know whatever you know but a one non-flying day one non-flying day during that week that's very important um but if i can say maybe one word also for the weather uh, uh what i see sometimes is they have so a lot of, of, of information, sources of information. But do pilot really check whether it's the right weather? It's the weather from this day at that time and not another one. They hardly check that. And I always say to the to my people, check on that too. That's very important, you know. And secondly, um all the, 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 the forecast you can have, have your plan B with you. Where's your escape route? Where's your escape uh, destination in case of and okay maybe you can the weather is a bit bad maybe you you, know, you try maybe you can go through and if not can you escape can you come back or are you then somewhere lost or uh, yeah that is that is the point so uh, information about weather is good flying is the other thing about it yeah and and of course um, if you can uh... If you can get uh, like an IFR rating, that is a really good thing uh, to have in the pocket. For like in in the northern parts here in, in Norway, when I fly with students and stuff, uh, sometimes the weather is getting marginal, and I think it's so much for the student to learn to fly in marginal conditions. Because if you have a student only flying in good weather all the time, and they got their license, and they have never been in like a marginal situation before then they need to do all the decision making on their with um, by themselves so i had in, in i also also have a ifr um uh, rating uh, because i think that also will give the student better training because this is, a, is the weather is, is a big issue for for long trips and yes. if you if you haven't experienced marginal weather it can be really frightening and it's in sometimes it can be really hard to do the take the right decisions i think um and especially if you top that up with like get the right is i need to get there and you you've been waiting for days and now finally the weather is all it's good enough it's good enough okay and then you go then it's you can get in a really tricky situation as well so what do you do if you get in a tricky weather situation fanny do you have any suggestions well <laughs> It, uh, probably Philip is a bit better uh, to answer this question because I usually find 99% of my flights, unless I'm examining or I'm an instructing, I do IFR. So, but um, the truth be told, I also fly to a lot of airports that are not IFR airports. So I do en route IFR because that will protect me from penetrating airspaces. And trust me, I've done my fair share of illegally entering airspaces, like I think many of us. Um, uh, luckily, I it didn't never cost my license or serious safety, but I did uh, have difficulty. So I prefer to actually do the cross country bid IFR and then do the approach if the weather permits. If the weather is good, cancel IFR and the descent, and then do a visual approach. Um, but uh, yeah, Philip already said it. Plan B. There must always be a plan B. Uh, either 180 and back where you came from. The last moment you still had good weather. And go back there. Um, yeah, en route alternates is what's what comes to mind if if you know that there's some weather coming your way. I'm the aircraft I'm I'm flying a, as you as you already know or most people probably guessed by now were diamonds and and because I have de ice anti ice I have oxygen like I spaceships. Have, I yeah and I have two fat Garmin thousands giving me so much information but I'm really spoiled rotten in the airplane and I <laughs> and I'm. I'm 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 cushioned in the safety of of having you know a diamond under me, um, yeah. Flying IF, I mean having an IFR rating, and there are different options now with the ASA how to get an IFR rating, and there's even different bits of IFR rating like en route IFR or just you know, um, these these different approaches to it. Um, that's definitely what I would suggest if someone asks me like how can I be a safe pilot? I want to take my family from A to B. What do you recommend? I would say get your IFR rating. That will that should keep you safe. And of course, get an airplane that is IFR equipped because you're only as good as the equipment of your aircraft. Yeah, because uh, this brings us a little bit into um, a topic which 
I think very highly about, and that's like threatened management. And that is coming more and more in place also in general aviation. In some places they are used a lot, in other places it's more uncommon. And it's like threat and error management is to identify the threats and to have a plan for errors. Um, there's a lot of human factors in there. And, and you also need the management part where you actually have a plan to do something about the threats and the errors if they occur. Um, so I think that if you get into bad weather, uh, it's, it's, it's really e e important to try to, to do the decision as early as possible, of course, but you want to get there at, at the same time. So it's hard, but you need to train that. And if you can do that with the instructor, I, I really recommend that. Um, and I find a lot of trust in ATC. So I, I know that there's quite different phraseology. Um, uh, it's people talk different accents in Europe. But even though use the radio, if you, if you, if you can, and I know that a lot of people are a little bit afraid of using the radio. We just run a campaign in Norway um, to um, for the A to C people to the A to C stuff that they really need to take care of general aviation as well, because uh, if we if it is a low threshold to contact A to C, that will be a huge safety benefit as well. I think uh, to have a good communication with ATC because that's a huge asset to have if you have some problems and they are trained for that as well. I think that's important. And like for my flight, I was flying from like like Tier in 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 Germany, and I was going to Spain, and I was like everybody said, "Oh Jesus, are you going to cross French airspace? <laughs> they, they they they're going to they're going to talk French to you, you know." And I took off from Tierra and I was so worried. And I was like, oh my God. And I contacted like the French ATC and it was crystal clear English with no problem at all. I was a little bit afraid of the airspace as well because uh, it was really like busy airspace um, with a lot of um, like restriction areas and stuff. But with like the navigation app, I think it was just wonderful. And I had a really nice trip to, to France as well. Um, and um, it was really surprising because I was so tense. I was so afraid that they were going to switch to French because I, I don't know much about French, talk, talking <laughs> French. So, uh, but it was a really good experience. Uh, so I really recommend that as well. Um, yeah. Um, May I say a word to that? Because yeah. I see a question from Jan Mons uh, from Belgium. Uh, about uh, English compulsory language on the radio. Uh, well, uh, I think that's maybe not the, the, the point, but the point is that we should be able and allowed to speak English at all stations. And I'm in the uh, language proficiency group of ICAO, and I'm fighting for that. Because uh, and what you said in, in France, um, uh, the aerodromes which do not have IFR procedures uh, and when there's nobody on the on the radio no office nothing then you have to talk in French and if you don't do so then uh, you run into troubles but it always depends of who is actually on the ground but uh, if you if, if, if you are in, in bad weather and you would like now to land into terminate your flight and you speak English on the radio in, in France, the, that's absolutely not a problem. Like in Germany, in Germany, you must speak uh, German on the small airfields. But, but if you, you find about, information about that uh, on the chart, doesn't you? Is, doesn't it just say German yes. only? Or it's it like, says, yeah. it says which yeah. language is in use, you know. And uh, um, then uh, but if you speak then uh, English, on those stations, no problem at all. So please, everybody in Europe, speak English wherever you can. That is the best and everybody will understand it. And if you say, uh, uh, Hotel Bravo Charlie India Oscar final runway two five, there's nobody in the world who wouldn't understand this message. Yeah. And then you're safe. And in French. Uh, if, you know, uh, that problem is the, is the, the languages. Uh, you actually can land or operate on small airfields without using the radio. And you, if you just keep silence, just because of uh, some regulations, then you, you're really on the bad side. Use the radio whenever you can. 
yeah yeah I, I, I concur totally it's I think it's quite important to use the radio and even if it doesn't sound good it's it doesn't matter because it's more important that people actually know that you're there as well um, but we also have alternatives when it comes to radio in in uncontrolled airspace and you have uh, have you checked this uh, website it's um, safe sky it's uh it's um it's like for uh, I conspiracy uh, you can use your your phone to save, tell everybody where you are and you can share the position and I get it up. I can have it in, in my sky demon as well, but you need to have like cellular courage to, to share uh, your position or you can use ADSB though. Uh, I think that's, that's quite good uh, as well. And now John brings up the website there and John, we talked to these guys uh, at Friedrichshafen. We did, and actually, we're going to be releasing that the interviews, uh, the interview we did with Safe Skies fairly soon, and in talking to them again, hopefully in uh, in Aero this year as well. Yeah, if you per press the the live button in up in the right corner there, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, you see what's happening. So there, you can see a lot of traffic, and I see now now that I saw the first SRD eight sixty. Uh, that's the new. Um, that's new for especially um, small or lighter airspace users as like drones, paragliders, you can even use it in small aircraft, but that's a really, it's going to be a huge step to get that in here as well. But this, I, I think this is tools. It's just tools. It's so important to look outside because it's VFR, so visual flight rules, that's important. But I, I think this, this is going somewhere. So you can you see that with a with um yeah you marked one oh, if you yeah, see I'll, any I'll, blue it looks like see, more of a light aircraft yeah if you see any blue icons that's only from like um from a mobile phone this is mode S you can see the status down on the left side there the ADSB as well so this is coming and I I know that um, your colleague John Vladimir is working on this he is. Uh, a lot get this going but it's just another tool though i think to look out the window is of course the most important part uh, one thing i want to ask you uh, guys is how about maintenance if you run into some snags trouble what do you do if you have a flat tire what how do you solve that uh, all right I'll, I'll start i'll start if i may um again this, I can only speak for the Diamond Fleet because I happened to work for them for a while. And, and my husband, who is also Hungarian, he also works for Diamond. He works actually in the after sales technical support. And this is not a commercial. I'm just saying this because um, with most aircraft in the general aviation world, us pilots, we are not allowed to do anything. You can refuel, check your oil and maybe tire pressure and of checklist. Yeah, so you're basically not allowed to touch Maybe oxygen system you can refill, uh, but this is really the the end of end of how much maintenance you're allowed to do. Um, I know that uh, in each country, Diamond at least has a certified um, maintenance base, which you will find on the homepage. I'm assuming that most of the manufacturers that you fly, like Piper, Seneca, um, Piper, Cessna, um, Slim, to be more exotic, or um, any any manufacturer that uh, that we have in Europe that we use in Europe um, will have their maintenance locations. But I think uh, Philip has a better insight with the AOPA members having having some kind of uh, unity and and um, way to get maintenance. So I'll I'll pass the voice on to you. Probably more useful than my shiny diamonds. <laughs> It comes about with the same. Uh, what we do as AOPA member, we call the local AOPA representative and he will help you. That's it. Oh, and so uh, or maybe you are at the airfield where they have a local uh, workshop there and uh, uh, all that uh, can be helpful. And uh, that is, that, let's be honest, there's hardly a problem with maintenance. Uh, the last one I had was actually a, a flat tire, uh, a, a worn down tire, uh, and it happened in Ivalo. It was in the uh, very in the in the northern part of of uh, Finland, and uh, the AOPA Finland uh, could manage that a spare tire was brought up by the captain of an airliner flying into Ivalo. 
Oh, nice. uh, things like that. So uh, maintenance, uh, from my point of view, is not a critical uh, issue. Basically, you also should check with if you were chartering the aircraft, and you, I would, if I would rent an aircraft from a charter company or from whoever has the a, well, these are not AOC aircraft, but whoever is the holder of the aircraft, I would give them a ring and say, okay, I'm here in Mykonos. Um, but what do you want me to do? Do you want me to call the local or are you going to send down guys or, you know, should I call the aircraft AOG and fly home by airline? But uh, yeah, I think contacting the owner of the aircraft is also a good point. What they yeah. Well, uh, um, maintenance regulation is not my cup of tea. We got really good people for that. And I, maybe I can challenge John to put together a, like a maintenance pilot owner uh, workshop or webinar at uh, one point, but uh, I know that in like the part M light, you have like owner pilot maintenance as well. You can do some tasks, uh, which is not flight critical, uh, but uh, now I'm really on thin ice here as well. So, so we should get in those experts to cover that because our people would really like to know what kind of, what can I do? What can I not do? And that's really important to not mess with things you don't know. And, but some things you can do, uh, of course. And, and actually, I'd love to, originally, I'm an engineer by background, so um, I always love the chance to get a pair of overalls on again. It's been quite a long time since I, I've, I've done any proper spannering on an aircraft. So, yeah, I think well, it's some, definitely something that's in our plan to try and organize in the next few months. Yeah, I remember when part M came and it was really hard for GA because it was so it was made for like airliners, but I know that with the light version, it, it, it's getting better. And, but we need to have really good experts to talk about this because it's, uh, it's a big topic as well, uh, I think. Uh, and I see that in the chat, some people are, are talking about you know, this. So this is something that actually means something um, and we need to talk about that. So and, please and put think, it on your list, John. <laughs> and, and I think actually it's interesting when you see the comments, I think we need, if certainly from our side, we need to be better at explaining to people what they can and can't do. I think a yeah. lot of it is just the information is currently kind of just too hard to find from our side. So it's, yeah, it's certainly something we need to improve from our side. Um, can okay, I'd just like to still add one input because I also have been reading the chat and I'm, I've, it's, it's great to know that people who own aircrafts are allowed to touch some screws this and that i remember I, my basic licenses also originate from the faa from florida um but i can assure you and i'm this is just valid for diamonds at least i can put my hand into the fire you do not want to open the cowling you do not want to do any kind of maintenance full stop okay so okay. all that i read here might work for some other aircraft with diamonds you do not make maintenance because you screw up your warranty you 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 enter you open Pandora's box. You don't want to do that. You call your main, you call your diamond maintenance guy. <laughs> it's it's a really interesting one actually. I remember when in fact when when I saw you last, funny when we were in Eagles back, we yep. were at the Diamond Service Centre, and it was and it's led to a lot of interesting conversations, even just in our own building at Yasa, when you hear the challenges of you know the kind of cost of an aircraft service centre and that. Yeah, you pay less at a di the Diamond Service Centre in Eagleback than you do at the Mercedes or the Land Rover service station in Frankfurt. You know, it's pretty good value for money in, in that context. So it's, you know, when you look at it in comparison to other things we do in our life, you know, it, it's not as easy as just saying, you know, yes, there are these things you can do. I, you know, I, I could go and fix my Renault outside, but it probably wouldn't be a good idea. Um, and yeah, you know, it depends on the type of car, the type of aircraft. Similarly, um, John, can can you not bring up the like the ASA community page? Because if people have questions for like regulations, I know that you have this ASA community page, and I think um, you should maybe advertise a little bit for that page because it's yeah, a good source. Really In fact, that's it's worked out. It's it's it's, it's really good actually. Because when I bring it up, this seminar is the first thing that's on the page there. Um, Ooh. So there's there's a lot of questions that we get here, and it's the same to a degree with the Facebook group as well. Now we, we it's all depending on the time of year and how busy all our experts are. We don't always get the chance to follow up right away, but 
we have regular sessions with our experts to try and answer as many questions as we can. Uh, and also it's good because other people in the community answer questions as well. So, you know, you can just add uh, a question here. You can even, you know, add, an, add a video or an image of what you're, the problem you're talking about uh, and post that for others. It's, it's really good like that. So, yeah. So we are preparing the quiz questions here now to make it really hard. It's going to be a terrifying quiz, um, I guess. But, I, yeah. I just read the, the comment of, of someone in the chat and uh, I fully agree. I wish, and this is also a request from me as a fellow aviator pilot to EASA because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guest on your show, so to speak. Um, someone just wrote, in the US, you have the far aims. Anyone who ever flown in the US knows the far aims. It costs nothing, five to ten dollars. It comes out every year. It has even pictures inside with color explaining all kinds of things. And it's it's law lawyers English translated to pilot slash common person's English, where you can actually understand your aviation laws in real words. And I wish we would have something like that in the ASA as well. I can fully agree to whoever wrote that. It's, 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 it's Eastman, it's, be perfect. I would. I, I wish we have far aims for Europe. I'll I'll, uh, I'll take that back to the GA roadmap team. Thank um, you. Interestingly, the Australians, even though they have the official rules, I love the fact that they have a plain language rule ah. book as well, which sounds like the same kind of thing. So. Yeah, I'll I'll add that to the list to take to the GA. But it's important to point out that pilots, we're not morons. It's not like we're, 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 you know, imbeciles or we don't speak English. But let's face it, we're no lawyers. At least few of us are lawyers. Um, many of the regulations and rules, my, I would say I speak good English or I think I do. Um, I have difficulties understanding all the rules and regulations. We have arguments here in Austria with other pilots like, so who is logging PIC if you're the examiner, if I'm sitting on the right side, but I don't touch the aircraft, blah, blah, blah. And then we start a never ending conversation about EASA regulation in which country and what you read out of that law and what someone else interprets. So that's what I mean, John, by having some kind of basic language version for pilots. And I'd hate to say this, but I've been in, I, I've been in cafe, in coffee rooms at EASA where the two experts who wrote the same rule can't agree. So. Ah. It's not that bad. I'm just yeah, but, but that that's quite. I think it's uh, getting a little bit better with the easy access version. But but the problem is that uh, language, language is very is legal. It's it's just legal language. So you really need to 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 know the legal text. So and that's why I think session like this is really important because this is safety promotion, and that is explaining a practical content and to apply the rules as well. John, do you know? Can you bring up like part ops or like Sarah or something? It's it's and use the easy access version. I think that can be helpful because you have the rule and you have the the guidance material, and you have the AMC, the acceptable means of compliance. So it's three parts of the rules, and even that says that it, this is complex. But uh, mm -hmm. as as being regulators and being um, uh, competent authorities is a really important part for us to to start to do more safety promotion to, to, you know, to meet people so and just, actually apply it. Uh, yeah. yeah, so here's an example, in fact, probably a bad example using the uh, CIRA rules because it's mostly all guidance material, but I'm just trying to find a relevant part where, but, where it has them all together. Oh, there we go. Yeah, but pick, pick, pick up example. the online version. If you take the online version, it's quite easy. It's easier to find. Uh, no, don't use the PDF, but um, that's just a way to show it. Uh, when it comes to like uh, safety promotion, and we are talking about uh, uh, visiting uh, countries, we some countries do have something called VFR guides. Yeah, this is the, the online version, which is, I think is a little bit be better because you have like the annexes uh, on the left side, yeah. And you, yeah, it's you really right... good to be able to navigate down the different articles and even you can see the different. Yeah, uh, so if you, if you, if you, yeah, if you take that one and if you right click, you can actually get a, a link for the 
exact that that part of the regulation as well so it's, it's and, quite and that's what we're starting to do a lot more of is when we create safety promotion material to explain something complicated it's great because we can then link straight into the particular rule we're talking about with the anc and gm so it makes it much easier to cross reference from the complicated bits to the you know where we talk about them in more general terms yeah, and like Sarah, that's that's the same, almost the same as like IKO Annex Two as well. So it's it's not that different um, than IKO. Um, but I know it's it's a lot of rules, so we have to need to explain them. Um, so if I can just show you like um, I can show you the Norwegian VFR guide. Um, just a brief moment, please. It's like this one. So this is the Norwegian VFR guide, and that, that for if you want to visit Norway, you can go in here and you can find uh, a lot of useful information. I saw it was a question about how to enter like Norwegian uh, airspace or, or border cross operations, and like no, Norway is outside um, EU. We are not an EU member, but we are a, we have a agreement, a Schengen agreement. Um, so if you look like here, you will see how to deal with customs, uh, which is quite maybe a little bit different than within the EU. And you find a checklist like that. Uh, in Norway, you will also have like airspace with, um, it's, it's a little bit different when it comes to a lot of AFIS uh, airports like this, Aerodrome Flight Information Services. If you have a lot of short air uh, fields, um, and you will fly along with like commercial uh, operators like Vidra here. Uh, so, um, and you know, these, these uh, airports, they don't have like controlled uh, airspace. So we only get uh, information service as well. In, in the Northern parts, it's quite different to fly um, when it comes to terrain, weather, and we give a lot of tips here. And here you'll find a nice picture of uh, oh. airport just outside here in Lofoten area. It's quite short though. I've been here. Wait, You've where been is here. That? Yeah, I've, been, I've been on the way when I went up to the Andenes. I told you, remember uh, Ennoia? Yeah, Ennoia. Yeah. yeah, this is a short one. So we have a, a, a network with the, these kind of airports in Norway uh, and they're almost exactly alike with uh, the terminal and the taxiways. So if you know one, you know them all. Uh, only the runway heading is in uh, <laughs> direction is, is different though. So this is just an example. And you get some, some small tips, tricks here um, for good destination. Some like with a lot of these airports, they're located close to terrain, big mountains, stuff like that. So you get like this, um, wind charts that show you local wind gusts and stuff like that. Um, we deal with a lot of uh, icing in Norway. So even in the summer, I've been flying like in 6,000 feet and just icing down uh, and you need to descend to a, to a um, higher temperature to get, uh, get it off. Um, so yeah, but um, uh, if you want to go to Norway, please just read the, the VFR guide. And now I want to challenge you a little bit because uh, in the end here, after all these like uh, search and rescue and stuff like that, you will find VFR guides for other countries. So I'm trying to make a list with VFR guides. So if you know about a guide I don't have here, please just put it in the chat and I can update my list and get it uh, complete so, maybe. So Thomas, I have, I have a homepage, uh, which is not quite a VFR guide as such, but it is a it is a homepage. It's called um, HungaryAirport.au. It will show you all of the Hungarian airports, even the ones that don't have ICAO codes. It will show you runway length, layout, uh, frequency, uh, availability of different types of fuel. It's a brilliant page. I'm gonna. It's actually literally just um, HungaryAirport.au. So if uh, if you could, um, John, could you just look it up if it really the if it's really HungaryAirport.au. Alpha Golf Uniform. Sorry, what? <laughs> AG A uh, Hungary, Hungary Airport. Airport. Oh, okay. So each time from Hungary, right? It's a bit outdated. Uh, in in it might be 
it might be true, but still it gives you a good idea on how many airports Hungary has. A lot of them are not in international database. And again, I would do what I always do when I plan a flight. I either write an email or I call the place to make sure it exists. I'm welcome to come with the size of aircraft I'm coming if they can provide fuel and any kind of services, whatever I need. May that be customs or, um, you know, a hotel room or just a dinner, a lunch or whatever. So I think it, and I think it helps also you can ask about the use of language when you get there as well. <laughs> when you're approaching sometimes. I know that's worked for a few people. Are you going to get really angry if I suddenly turn up and start using English when I arrive? And, uh... Yep. So, uh, yeah, I just saw in the chat there was a good, uh, Thomas, this is for you. Do you see what Istvan wrote? There is a good VFR manual dot hungarocontrol.au pages, aerodromes, etc. Oh, nice. Maybe nice. something that you can um, add to your collection of uh, VFR. I'll email that to you now, Thomas, so you don't miss it. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much. I, I, see, I see they also talk a lot of ADSB now, so we are doing that in Norway as well, trying to um, have a test project much alike than what you, they have in UK now, uh, because and work with the, the SRD new, new standards for, for drones as well. So um, we really believe into ADSB, even though it's been a long walk to to get to the to the project as well to the to the test project. But we're getting there, I think. Um, so, yeah. Thomas, is it worth? Is, it, is there a chance to take a couple of questions from the Slido? We've been asking people to use Slido and upvote things. So there's of course. One there, when crossing an international IFR, one is sometimes asked to submit a UK GAR entering France or a Gendec entering Belgium. Do people have specific softwares to do this? Um, do you have experience, Fanny, maybe you? Yeah, so yeah, entering the UK, you need the GAR, not France. You don't need it. Well, I don't mm. know what, I, I don't think you need anything for France, to be honest. Uh, for the UK, you definitely need the GAR, um, which is easy because you can either put it, fill it in online which is the easiest way. It will ask you for your call sign, your name, your nationality, passport number, date of birth, passengers, same data for the passengers. Uh, and if you change your call sign because you change aircraft or if you change whatever data, you have to submit the whole thing again. But again, it's it's online. It's very simple. It's drop down menus. It's, you know, pick and and if you go in GAR online UK or something like that, if you type that into Google, you will find it. It's very easy to do. It's a five minute job. That's all you got to do for the UK. It's not very complicated, other than your normal pre-planning. Um, what else? For France, nothing. I, I, honestly, within the European Union, within Schengen, you do not need, other than the GAR, nothing comes to my mind right now, what you might need in a European country. Well, you need a Gendek in, in Belgium. Oh, yeah. That, okay. that, that is a paper you have to carry with you. That's the idea behind. But Gendek, it's so an old stuff. Uh, I'm very surprised that uh, Belgium still uh, needs that. Honestly, just printing a Gendek, just find some general Gendek form online, put in your name, leave the rest, That's you can manually fill it in uh, and just have it ready for any airport around the world. Just have like two, three copies on your airplane for whatever country might need it. If you go into North Africa, like Egypt, which is easily reachable still for general aviation aircraft, because I used to go with DA-40 single engine piston uh, from, you can go from Cyprus um, into Egypt and a homemade Gendek will do, like literally just, you know, a homemade little Gendek form, any Excel sheet with name of passengers and pilots and passport number will do. Wow. Huh. So, so there was a question, so I guess it's, we should, everybody assumes it's, it's an easy one, but um, the rules with international flying and licenses and restrictions. Yeah, obviously in the ASA member states, it's fine. But how, what's your experience going beyond that? Flying to other countries, have you had any problems with licensing? Uh, if this is going to me? Yeah, I think you're probably yeah, not. Not at all. Not at all. Never. Honestly, if I think about the past four years and me flying all around the world, going from Burkina Faso all the way to... Taiwan, not once in my whole life did I have to show my pilot license. Not a single time. What they do want in many airports all around the world, even within the EU, is a crew ID. But a crew ID can be also just if you are, if you are AOPA member, 
because I'm I'm Austrian Europa member, they will give you a, a like a crew ID. It will just say your pilot license number, like in my case, AT FCL, and then the number uh, you exactly like oh, that will be accepted in international airports everywhere around the world. They're not going to question the integrity of that. Well, in in Norway, we actually do a ramp checks for, for GIA as well, and that. That's the, mainly two parts. The first one is to check that you are prepared for for flight in in Norway, um, and that you have your paperwork in order. But the other part is also uh, safety promotion as well, and uh, to see if people are prepared for the conditions and the threats they will be exposed to in in the Norwegian environment. Um, so we do do these stops, and if you get stopped, it's no problem. In most cases, we we just have a talk and you know, have a nice flight. And, to the, which part you want to go. That's true, but what you are referring to is now a ramp check. What John was yeah. asking me on like, uh, you know, how is it to travel with the, with the EASA license all around yeah. the world? So I yeah. think those are two different things. Yes, yeah, for a ramp course, check. Course. Obviously for a ramp check, you need to have all your documentation, mass and balance, POH, whatnot ready. But it's another thing, if your license is ex accepted worldwide, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, it's ICAO standard. Yeah. It definitely is. I have not never been anywhere where they've been. What I do have, <laughs> funny enough, you should mention, um, but then now we're going into, if you fly to Canada and you're going to fly a Canadian registered aircraft, you need a validation for Canada. Or I was flying an aircraft uh, registered to um, San Marino, <laughs> which is <laughs> Tango 7 registration. So I needed, a, I needed a validation for San Marino. Which I still have. It's probably the most exotic, exotic and useless piece of paper I own, which is my EASA license validation for San Marino. <laughs> oh, in New Zealand, you have to do that as well. If you want to fly a New Zealand airplane there, you need to do a validation. Yeah. But again, that's just if you have a different registration. Oh, yeah, no. But that's, it's not that complicated, actually. And if you're not sure, just contact the local people and they will tell you about it. Okay, I'm just reading a question. Sorry, I'm, this is a bit out of the loop. It says, uh, Martin, which is just I, quite trusty, a, that one. Perfect. a Polish person, probably with that name. Question about flying in Austria. Is it true you have to get a contact with one of the fuel companies to refuel on controlled Austrian aerodromes? Ooh, that's a good one. I mean, generally, it's a good practice to order fuel or, but I think if you have a BP card or any kind of credit card, you would get fuel all around Austria, no matter where. I mean, I'm thinking of, we don't have that many controlled airports in Austria. So it's Salzburg, Graz, Linz, Vienna, Klagenfurt, Hornems, end of checklist. Yeah. So no, if we have a few and they all, they all have, they all, they all take your credit card. If you want. Yeah. But, but that actually surprised a lot of pilots in Norway as well, because, uh, the fuel company in Norway, they don't accept, um, credit cards. cards. You need to have this like company card, like, yeah. like you mentioned. Okay. Okay. I I know that they even accept actually. cash. I know that if 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 you need fuel, they will accept cash in some places. I guess it's a question of urgency. Uh, credit card refused at Klagenfurt recently. Yeah, that I I can't. That might be the case. I I I couldn't attest to what what happened in Klagenfurt. I know that. Uh, I usually have even my private credit card just with me and. Uh, it, uh, Airbnb card or a fuel release, but that's again commercial flying, so that's probably not going to happen. Cash is king. Yes, I agree. <laughs> so, so I guess this is where another one where phoning ahead and speaking to people, yeah, you, know, you start to get a better feel. Yeah, that's what I said at the beginning. The most direct and best info is still talking to another human being, addressing your questions and doubts in person. If you're going to Klagenfurt, call the AIP number uh, from the Austrian AIP for Klagenfurt. I spoken to the tower guys frequently. They're common, normal people speak good English and you can say, how can I refuel at Clanford? And they will give you their take on it. If, if, if it helps, I'd, I had a similar problem where I couldn't refuel nine Air Force tornadoes in Bermuda for the last <laughs> wrong credit card. And actually I had to go and get some cash out from somewhere from an Amex office to pay the Air Force's fuel bill before we could carry on across the Atlantic. So happens in many different cases. Uh, yeah, fuel is uh, a really big issue, but another issue, which is really huge, is the quiz. Excellent. Uh, so I want to drop the, the quiz now in the chat. So if you want to attend the chat, you 
can uh, actually just click on the link. And um, if you if you want to um, um, be a part of the content context contest here, you need to give your name and email address so we can uh, give you the prize. Um, Drum roll. And what is the prize, John? So we have different prizes. So the first prizes we have, we have a, a, a we have three goodie bags of things. If you've ever wanted an IASA goodie bag with some IASA pens and things, like you know, impress your friends with gifts from your favourite aviation regulator, then we have one. And then particularly thanks to uh, thanks to Gamma, the the GA Manufacturers Association Association, we also have. Uh, bags uh, from Daher and also from Elixir. And actually, if anybody happens to be coming to Aero at Friedrichshafen, we, you can come to Aero and pick up the bags there from us. And if not, we will be collecting them from Aero and sending them on from there. So, yeah. And then we have two other ones, don't we, Thomas? Yeah. Uh, Philip, you said that you could uh, give some time of your life. Tell you, uh, tell tell the people what you you uh, can put to the table, put on the table. Yeah, um, a lot of people they fear to come to Switzerland because flying in the Alps might be very dangerous. In fact, it is dangerous if you don't know how to fly in the Alps. But it's very very pleasant if you know the rules and uh, how to behave in the Alps. And I would like to offer. Uh, an alpine introduction, uh, introduction of alpine flying um, uh, for a day. Uh, the only thing is the applicant has to come with his plane to Switzerland and then we go flying into the Alps. And uh, you're in, no you're in Zurich. For me. You're in Zurich? Yeah, but uh, I, I will tell him not to land at Zurich for various reasons. There are a lot of lovely airfields around and I'll tell him uh, what to do and how to do and also the customs uh, because we are not in the custom units we are within Schengen but Schengen has nothing to do with customs so I will be helpful for the applicant to fly uh, to uh, Switzerland and we can go into the Alps and enjoy flying around the highest peaks. Very good and Fanny you said also before we started that you had a, a wonderful price it's, yes. it's a hard and tough price, though, but it's, yes, it's a price. and I hate to disappoint the many people who are hoping to get the prize of a TA-42. Uh, that's unfortunately out of question. <laughs> if I had one, I'd keep it for myself. Um, but the A-50, nice question. Yeah, no, <laughs> neither a DA-50. None of the things that start with diamond. Uh, <laughs> but what I can offer you, if you are a licensed pilot and you can come to Wiener Neustadt, Lima, Oscar, Alpha, November, that's my home base. I'm happy and you need a skill test or a license proficiency check on a multi engine piston aircraft or single engine piston aircraft. I am happy to be your examiner as as a price. Okay, thank you. Very much. Of, of course, you need to have an EASA license. I'm only allowed to examine EASA member states, but I guess that was, I, that was a given. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Then I just uh, put out the link. So my colleague here, Anders, he put together a question. So I don't even know the answers myself here. So I think we just need to give people uh, some minutes to actually uh, answer this. We're a little bit on over time. So I know that this was a longer uh, talk than we were um, planned for, but um, that was as expected though. <laughs> Maybe while people are answering the quiz, I can just a few comments that have also been put in Re the essential how essential it is to read notams somebody put in obviously an interesting and important point um somebody said asked about safe sky and um is it dangerous to use applications that only provide partial information and you know, it's one of the continual challenges of the discussion about iconspicuity particularly is there is no until we get to the the holy grail of something that works for everything. It's sort of building up whatever picture you can with the tools that you have available. Uh, yeah. but remembering that there's ultimately no substitute for looking out of the window. Uh, well, I, I, I saw the commenter as well. That was uh, like lagging. Um, I've, I've used SafeSky for a long time. And I never experienced that lagging. Um, 
Uh, I don't know if that uh, is for some local areas or something, but um, I also combine it with an ADSB receiver as well. So, um, and then it gets pretty good though. Um, and I use it to like, when we do fly with, I, I do a lot of aerobatic training and we need to fly in controlled airspace. So we have to find good spots in the training areas. So we, we move a little bit when you see the traffic comes in because in, in many cases, the traffic like jam up uh, the, the, the airliners, they jam up in special parts of the day. So then we just move to, uh, to training areas, which uh, is not in the way of the airliners. So we make the, the traffic flow a little better. Um, Gentlemen, I just need to interrupt for one second. Sorry for the, the interruption. As I have to tend to my motherly duties, I need to put little Maverick which is not his real name, by the way. <laughs> um, I need to put my son to bed and I give, need to give him some dinner. Um, if there are any more questions, address to me, uh, John Thomas, um, yeah, you, can, you can guide them to me. You know how to reach me. You have my contact data. Yes. Just one, one thing before you go, uh, please. And that is this one. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So next week, is this next weekend? Yeah, I think it's next weekend. I'm flying up to Germany. I've been invited to give a speech, um, uh, a talk about, uh, I've done a, a ferry flight from Wiener Neustadt in Austria next to Vienna to Japan. I did it three times. One time I was flying over Russia when that was still possible. Uh, and two times I was flying what I call the Southern route. Um, and I'm just giving a, a, a presentation about that. It's more informal and some funny stories that happened en route. Obviously, also some flight planning, the legs, and any questions that are uh, asked. This whole thing takes place in a place called Aviators Farm, which apparently is this very, very cool place. Um, it's a, a guy who collects aviation memorabilia. So there will be all propellers on the wall, and it will be all aviation enthusiasts. Uh, uh, heaven, I guess. Uh, there will be a lot of female aviators because it was organized by the 99s, which is a women pilots association worldwide. I happen to be the Austrian governor um, for the Austrian section. So, yeah, that's just something I uh, wanted to put in there. It's, it's, it's going to be an exciting um, event. Lots of girl pilots, uh, female aviators, but also uh, men are absolutely welcome. We love to mingle and exchange. It's just like any other aviation event. Oh. Yep. Fantastic. It's great. It's great. So well, for joining uh, yeah. us, Fanny. Much appreciated. And, uh, Thank you for having me. And, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Yes, John, we'll stay in touch. Thomas, tschüss and tak. Tschüss und tak. Schönen Abend noch. And goodbye, Joe Sakat. And auf Wiedersehen. Fanny out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, yeah. Fanny left, so we are just going to do the draw, I think. Um, I will check the, um, if anyone have all uh, questions correct. Um, that is going to be interesting. There we are. So. Maybe while you're just totting them up, I can uh, quickly remind everybody that we have another session at the same time next week uh, on instructor flying that uh, my colleague Vendel will be hosting with uh, some instructors, instructor flying with it on instructing and training. Um, so we'd love you to join us. I'm just going to put the link to that in the chat as well. So uh, if anybody need, wants to register for that session as well, we'd love to see you next week. So we, if we, we, if we go now to, we have, if we end the quiz now, we have 40 answers. Um, and um, actually we have a list here as well. So uh, I can just uh, go to the first one. So the first winner and how should we do? What's, what's the first prize? We didn't decide what's the first prize. Is, uh, is it Philip or is it? We need to have uh, like uh, one. Two, we need to draw five people here now. So the first one, uh, that is uh, <laughs> that is. Um, let's see here. 
Milan, the Mystere, the Mystere. Milan, the Mystere. That's the first winner, number one. And the second one. With uh, 100%. Uh, Kieran, that's the next winner, number two. Are you, are you uh, are you taking a note of these, Thomas, so we can we don't miss them? Yeah, and you record as well. Uh, yeah, we do have the recording. Um, maybe one thing, maybe we can check if before we decide which prize, if there are certain people who can use the two or not. Maybe we have a we email yeah. the people first. Of course. That's a good one. And let's see. Let's get up the numbers here. Like that. And Nathan Gray is the third. And Marcel Mertens. The fourth and the last is with 100% Jan Moons. So that's that five people. Okay, so cool. if we drop them an email and we figure out from there, and, and actually it's yeah. a shame because I see Kieran can't make it to Switzerland or Austria, and I was only in Ireland last week and I could have taken something, but I'm sure we can manage to figure that out. And it goes without saying that uh, this prize serves uh, the Alpine flying uh, is not applicable for Swiss people. That would be unfair. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it's just a quiz, but I'm actually surprised because a lot of people got uh, like hundred percenter. So I just picked the the first persons in the list. Let's see. And and then we'll see if we can get get some more. Even if everybody gets at least an Iasa pen or something. We'll see what we can manage. Yeah, I, I, I will. I, I have the whole complete lister. So if you have given your email, we can see what it's like. It's like 45 uh, answers. So why not? I think we should manage that uh, 48 answers. Sorry. So that's good. But with with that, I want to uh, I, I need to end this uh, conversation. And Philip, thank you very much for uh, sure. for sharing your thoughts and uh, time, of course, for them to do this. And I hope that people out there as well have had a good time, get some good answers and get some inspiration to do a flight um, maybe across um, Europe. And of course, welcome to Norway if you want to come here as well. You have a uh, AOPA uh, affiliate here as well, I know, uh, Philip. So that's good. And John, thank you for uh, having us. Um, it was a great session, I think. So uh, we will put it out on YouTube. Is it, we, is that yes, so we'll edit the recording down and we'll have it on YouTube, certainly by Monday, Tuesday next week, and people can watch it back and share it with their friends. And yeah, really yeah. great. Huge thanks to for me to uh, and the rest of the EASA team to Philippe and to Fanny and particularly to Thomas, who did all the hard work here uh, organizing uh, this session. And you know, Thomas is such a key member of uh, our network with the national authorities, particularly on GA. So yeah, we couldn't do it without you. So huge thanks, Thomas. For that. Thank you very much. You're too kind. But uh, anyway, have a great evening and uh, have a safe flight. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.